13 Week Theater is supported by Patreon. Subscribe now and get exclusive early access. Once upon a time, a television manufacturer created the station so his customers would have something to watch. Alan B. Dumont signed on W2XVT in Passaic, New Jersey in 1938. He later moved it to Manhattan, where with the start of commercial television after World War II, it became Channel 5 WABD. New York, window on the world. When Dumont connected WABD with another station he was building in Washington to share programming, the result was the world's first commercial television network. This is the Dumont Television Network. Without the resources to compete with radio juggernauts NBC and CBS as they built their own TV networks, and hampered by a new station freeze from the FCC that kept them locked out of a number of big markets, Dumont struggled along until 1955 when it officially ceased network operations. Dumont's owned and operated stations were spun off into a new company. While theoretically independent stations, they continued to share programs they created with each other and eventually started making programs for other independent stations to carry under the name Metro Media. Good evening, this is the 10 o'clock news, I'm Steve Powers. And today, confirmation of the largest single broadcast station transaction in history. When Rupert Murdoch decided to create a fourth television network in 1985, it made sense for him to jumpstart the process by buying the remains of its long gone first network. And thus would be born, FBC. Yeah, that name didn't last long, did it? To line up affiliates and have them in place for when he could start offering primetime shows, Murdoch decided to launch with a late-night talk show. After all, Metro Media had recently dabbled in its own late-night efforts, you know, the less said about which, the better, so it wouldn't be completely unknown territory. And when the time came to find a host, the choice was obvious. <laughs> Starting in 1983, Joan Rivers had become the permanent guest host for Johnny Carson during his one day off a week and whenever he went on extended vacations. Close friend of Johnny's and popular with the show's audience, there was soon talk that if Johnny retired after his 25th anniversary in 1987, Rivers would be his natural successor. Sadly, Rivers would learn, as others had, that being Carson's heir apparent didn't make you his heir. As years went on, Rivers' relationship with the NBC brass started to sour. She resented not being offered a long-term contract as Johnny's guest host. And even though both ABC and CBS had made overtures, she stayed in the job out of loyalty to Carson. At least until the other shoe dropped. NBC executive Jay Michellis, a friend of Rivers, sent Rivers what he said was a copy of an internal NBC memo with the names of 10 possible replacements if Carson retired in 1987. The one notable name not on that list? Joan Rivers. Around the same time, Rivers' friend Barry Diller, who is now chairman of 20th Century Fox, called her and asked if she would be willing to jump ship and become FBC's late-night host. Still reeling from the Michellis memo, Rivers agreed. What happens next is open to speculation. Everybody involved sold a different version of the story, but what it boils down to is this. Fox announced the Rivers deal before Rivers herself could call Johnny Carson and let him know. When Rivers did finally call Carson, he hung up on her and they didn't talk again for the rest of his life. 
The plan to distinguish the new show, now called The Late Show Starring Joan Rivers, centered around two novelties. First, since the trend for independent stations at the time was to have an hour of news at 10 o'clock, an hour before the network affiliates, Joan would start at 11, half an hour earlier than Carson. Clock. Ooh, let's oh, find out what the weather's going to be. Hold it, Harry! Hold it! My new show is coming on! Harry, Joan Rivers is talking to but you. But I like the weatherman's puppet, Mr. Sunshine. Harry, you want to know about the weather? Put your feet out the window. We're laughs! We've got music! We've got guests! Come on, go to sleep with a smile on your face for a change. Gee, I don't know. I'm not used to that. Harry! Okay, I'll try it. Oh, thank you, Harry. You're welcome. Um, uh... Joan. The Late Show. Coming and on two... The new show would be broadcast live. My new show, The Late Show, is going to be live. You know what that means? The guests are free to speak their minds. They'll be funny, they'll be serious, they'll be musical. And you're going to see and hear things you've never seen before on television. Sure, you're saying, I've heard that kind of hype often enough. Well, this is the reason The Late Show is going to be different. You all know what a bleep is. This is the bleep button. We are going to be live, and that means no bleeps. Scissors. I should have been a doctor. Premiering Thursday at 11 on CFMT Stereo 47. But even before the show hit the air, it was already in trouble. First, a number of potential affiliates were wary about Rivers, who was seen by some people as abrasive and occasionally offensive. In fact, one station in Milwaukee only agreed to affiliate with the network if they didn't have to carry the late show, which was the only program the network was airing at the time. And then in Boston, a top 10 market, Fox wasn't able to finalize their deal to purchase WXNE-TV in time for the show's launch. They offered to lease the time from the station's current owner, but that owner, evangelist broadcaster Pat Robertson, refused to carry the late show. The only deal Fox could work out in Boston would be to broadcast the show's audio on a low-rated AM radio station. Despite all the problems, Fox still managed to launch with the premiere of The Late Show on Thursday, October 9th, 1986. You bought my book, thank you. I, I have a whole monologue which we won't do tonight. I am just, it's been five months and so much has been said and so much has been written and I am just so, so happy to be here and I thank you all so much. The ratings were good at first, at least as good as they could be considering that the network barely covered half the nation's TV markets at the time. But that turned out to be short-lived, as curious viewers who decided to sample The Late Show eventually turned back to Carson. Another thing that hurt the show's ratings was that it was being actively sabotaged by none other than Johnny Carson. Feeling betrayed by Rivers' departure, Carson let it be known in Hollywood that anyone who agreed to appear on The Late Show would no longer be booked on The Tonight Show, which was still far and away the biggest thing in late night programming. This Carson blacklist made it hard for Joan to get A level talent on the show. Join me tonight for James Brolin from Hotel, comedian George Miller, and Peter Russell as Queen Elizabeth's butler. Okay. Join the party on New Year's Eve with Charles Delta Riley, ex prostitute Norma Jean, Alma Dovar, and pop singer Sylvester. On the next great. show, we're going to have Hotels, Connie Selica, musical group Gene Loves, Jezebel, and the LA Raiders who are going to sing. Sing? 
The low ratings and the frustration of not being able to get big-name talent frayed the nerves of both Rivers and the network. Things finally came to a head on May 15, 1987, when a final argument between Rivers and the network executives proved to be the last straw. Within minutes, word came down from New York. Rivers' services were no longer required, and that night's show would be her last. Unfortunately, however, Fox quickly learned why in broadcasting you never fire talent before their final air shift. They were very worried. They're all watching now with all their lawyers. I said, I will not say anything. So I'm not going to say anything. Sometimes you get together, you have differences, they have differences. Things don't work out. You know what I mean? It's nobody's fault. I have been in this business 23 years. I'm going to be in this business another 23 years. It doesn't matter. I was thinking maybe since it is the, you know, you know what show, LASD for tonight. I was thinking, you know, maybe we could just have some fun, you guys, you know, just sort of, you know. Fox struggled along with a rotating door of guest hosts, even shooting a week's worth of unaired pilot episodes with shock jock Howard Stern as host before they decided to pull the plug. Unfortunately, it turned out that they made that call just a wee bit too early. When comedian Arsenio Hall took his turn in the long line of fill-in hosts, Fox realized they had a hit on their hands. Overnight numbers showed a huge spike in younger viewers who appreciated the hip approach that Hall brought to the show. They quickly signed Hall to a 13-week contract. Why only 13 weeks? Because that was how long the show had to live. The call had already been made to cancel the Late Show weeks before and its replacement was already in production. What is the Wilton North Report? It's in-depth studies of today's banking world. They come here with the jar, they produce the sperm one way or the other. You have to be, of course, very careful. 
And that's just 1.37% of the Wilton North Report, November 30th. When the Wilton North Report brought in lower ratings than Rivers had at her worst, the network scrambled again. They killed Wilton North and brought back The Late Show. They called Arsenio Hall, but he had other commitments that would not let him return as host. So another revolving door and a short stint by host Ross Schaefer followed and also flopped. Fox finally canceled what was left of The Late Show on October 28th, 1988. Fox finally admitted defeat and threw in the towel on Late Night. It turned the 11 o'clock hour back over to its affiliates, which were happy to be able to fill it with syndicated reruns and movies. Fox concentrated on building up their primetime lineup and vowed to never try a late night. Ah, damn it. But I guess that's another story.